Um, so welcome to COVID variants, booster shots, and back to school uh, with our presenter, Dr. Jay Levy, who has been uh, coming back to get us through this pandemic over the last year and a half. Uh, and then also we will have our Q&A moderator, Dr. Morvin Maley. So before we get started, just want to do a shout out to our hosting organizations. My screen will work. Um, so for those of you who are Stanford alumni, if you are not already a Stanford uh, Club of San Francisco member, we welcome you to join us. Uh, if you live in the Bay Area and would like to do uh, fun things with, with fellow alumni, um, so we are open to all graduating years, all majors, undergrads, and grads. Uh, currently, we're doing a lot on Zoom, uh, but we do have our next event. It's going to be a tour of Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve, uh, which is an in-person event, our first in-person event since COVID. Unfortunately, that event is already full, um, but we are hoping to do an election proposition party before uh, the November election. So if you are on our email list, uh, you will get an email about that in October. Uh, and just to remind you, all of our events are organized by alumni volunteers. So we welcome you if you've got an idea for an event you want to organize, uh, something that you think would be of interest to fellow alumni, please email Christine. Uh, who, Christine, you want to wait? <laughs> uh, Christine, who is the president of the Stanford Club of San Francisco. And she'll be happy to, to talk with you. Um, also, um, for those of you uh, who are familiar with the village movement, uh, there are villages across the country which are grassroots organizations that help our neighbors helping neighbors age in place. Uh, so Next Village San Francisco serves Northeast San Francisco. And uh, we also have a variety of activities and events that are free for or most of which are free for adults age 50 plus in San Francisco. So these are some examples of our weekly and monthly events. And I just wanna point out, we've got uh, three language conversation groups, French, Italian, and Spanish, and we are just getting our Spanish group going. Uh, so if you are interested in conversing in Spanish with a group and are available any Mondays at 3 p.m., uh, please join us for that. Um, and also some special events that Next Village has coming up. Uh, we've got walking groups, we're going to be cleaning up North Beach, um, and also on the 31st, we're going to be doing our Halloween Masquerade Ball fundraiser. So we hope you can join us for some of those. Um, and to get involved with Next Village, you can join as a volunteer. We are always looking for volunteers for um, to do everything from walking partners, uh, help people shop, uh, help me with events. Uh, and we also do things like helping people change their light bulbs because um, not everybody wants to get on a ladder in a San Francisco uh, house with a high ceiling. So if you might want to help us out, uh, please check out our website. Uh, you can also, uh, if you want to find out about membership benefits, you can contact me or we welcome you to attend events. Um, and of course, uh, if you'd like to support Next Village, we do welcome contributions. Uh, just a few quick Zoom tips. I know most of you are, uh, are Zoom veterans. Oh, and Chuck, I will turn off the beeps as soon as I finish this presentation. So thanks for letting me know you can all hear those. Um, so Zoom tips, I know most of you are professionals at this. Sorry, my screen is slow. There we go. Um, so we will be doing questions via the chat. So as you've noticed, you cannot unmute yourself. Um, so there is a chat icon at the, uh, if you're on a computer or laptop, there is a chat icon that you can click um, to, to open the chat box where you can, where you can put in your questions. Um, also, here's the live transcript. So at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should be able to click a live transcript icon. And then there is a hide or I think it says show subtitles. So you can show the subtitles. I think the default is at the bottom, but if you want to see the full transcript where you normally see the chat, you can click the full transcript. If you need the font size larger, click the subtitle settings, which will get you into the settings and where that circle is you can see you can move 
um, move on the scale to increase the size of the font if needed. Um, I am going to put uh, Dr. Levy on um, spotlight mode, which means he's going to appear speaker view. Uh, if you do want to switch that to gallery view, um, move your cursor, and there is an option to chain toggle between speaker or gallery view up at your top right. For those of you on a tablet or smartphone, I'm sorry, this may be an old image, uh, but usually when you tap your screen, there's a dot, dot, dot more, and then you can uh, find the chat button. Uh, and also under the dot, dot, dot more, there should be the option to turn on closed captioning if you're not already seeing it. Okay, sorry for all those housekeeping announcements, but just want to make sure everybody knows the lay of the land before we get started. Uh, so Dr. Levy has been joining us since the beginning of this pandemic, and we are so grateful to him. Uh, in the early days, he was reminding us of the difference between bacteria and viruses, so we knew that we didn't really need to uh, wash all of our groceries. Uh, so at our last meeting with him in April, we were uh, excited about the vaccines and hoping that we were going to return to normal. Well, then uh, Delta has reared its head. And so here we are back again uh, to get more information from Dr. Levy. So thank you very much for joining us. And Dr. Levy, I'm going to pass it off to you. Very good. Thank you, Donna. It's been a uh, quite a, an eventful year and we, of course, hope that this time we would be in a different state, but it's still not bad. I mean, I think we've been able to get by with uh, a lot of good news in terms of conquering uh, this epidemic. Uh, I do want, I'm glad you brought up about the virus and the bacteria because I wanted to remind everybody when we started this, a lot of the advice given to people was as if this virus was a bacterium, it would be on your food, it'd be on your packages, uh, it would get on your doorknobs, the elevator buttons. Uh, this is a virus that's made out of fat and sugar. So it disintegrates outside very, very quickly. Uh, and certainly with sunlight as well. And it therefore doesn't need the same uh, protections in the everyday than uh, as someone like polio, which has a protein coat, which is very, very stable and maintains its structure. Uh, but what we've done now is what we've been able to create these vaccines that are very effective. I'll get into them in short way and, and answer your questions. But uh, in order to mitigate the ability of this virus to infect a cell, and I'll just show you and remind you, this is a picture of the coronavirus, COVID-19. And you notice those pink uh, triangular projections, those are the spikes. And that spike interacts with a cell and holds onto the cell. And the difference, so you remember this, is that in the variant, the attraction for that spike for its receptor, which is the ACE receptor, is maybe 10 times stronger. I may, may be exaggerating, but certainly five times stronger than the average virus. So that's why it doesn't need the same power to affect the cell. It also is the reason why it can affect children because children have less of these receptors. And so the regular variant had to search around to find it, but not this variant, Delta, which can attach to the children's receptor, ACE receptor, and infect the cell. So we also come away as well in, in the masks. And I, I'm not gonna take a lot of time, but let me just say that my philosophy is if you can get anything over your nose and your mouth, you will be contributing not only to not passing the virus from your secretions, but also from not getting them in, in yourself, uh, on yourself. And what's bothering me here in San Francisco, as you walk around, of course, outside, we don't need the mask, but even inside, you'll see some people put the mask below their nose and it really obviously doesn't really work that well. So when you see the data on people saying they get infected inside, you really have to ask, how are you wearing the mask? Because you need to make sure that's covered. Now, what we have determined in this year and a half is that when this virus infects a cell, and 
it's a human cell, it replicates, and it sort of obeys, I always say, the biblical expression for any entity on earth, be fruitful and multiply. And that's what it does. And my, my student, Barbara Schmidt, who now runs a lab in Germany, uh, told me from the beginning that she grew this virus in her lab, and she found that it could produce billions of, billions of virus particles, a particle. But when you look to see how infectious were these particles, it was one infectious particle for up to 40,000 uninfected, uninfectious particles. In other words, most of them were dead. Now it's I mean, remarkable then that we can see the virus spreading so easily. And I, I corresponded with her and she says that she's doing the studies now on the Delta virus. And she's convinced that there'll be more infectious viruses per thousands that are produced in one cycle. Uh, than we had with the alpha variant of the very first uh, virus. So we need then to recognize when these uh, viruses and variants get into the cell, uh, there is an immune reaction. Now, I think it's very important to return to the fact that if the immune system is strong, you're going to have a lot of symptoms. That's all the symptoms from a cold and certainly for, from this coronavirus are due to the immune system fighting the virus secreting toxic substances to kill the virus. And they only give toxic, well, they do that, plus they create toxic effects on the body. So when someone says I had a very bad reaction to COVID, you know, they, that immune system has really reacted against it. The same idea with a vaccine, that if the vaccine gave you pain in your arm, your immune system was probably already programmed a bit to recognize it, and it came on strong. If you didn't get a reaction, that's fine. That meant that you had an even balance in your immune, res your immune response. And let me, again, review, because it comes up a lot, the immune response. The immune response at the first line will be a B cell response, which are cells from the bone marrow, B, that produce antibodies. These are circulating substances that attach to the virus, to the coronavirus, and destroy it. Prevent it from attaching to a receptor and kill it. Well, that, those antibodies can be very effective. And what we've learned is that with all these vaccines, even though the vaccine has been directed at, let's say, variant alpha or beta, and not supposedly uh, the, the delta variant, the immune system is remarkable. When it sees a virus that's similar to the one that it was built against, it changes. So it's able to recognize that variant. So your vaccine is able to protect you against the variant. Not quite as well as the alpha, but pretty darn well. So if that's the beauty of the immune system. Now that antibody is produced for, in general, for most infections, oh, up to 12 months. It appears with the coronavirus, it's produced and starts to wane about six months. Now that has alarmed some public health people. They see the antibody going away and they think now you'll be infected. But they forget the fact that you have two arms of the immune system, the antibody, circulating proteins, and the cellular immune response, which are cells come from the thymus and from the lymph nodes and they go and they recognize infected cells and get rid of the virus in the infected cells. And those T cells, they're called T cells, will remain there for at least one year, two years. And as you, if you read about uh, the studies that were done in, uh, on the uh, 1918 flu, some of those responses are there hundreds of years later. So we have to put all that in perspective when we get to the discussion of the booster, because the booster shots are being recommended because we see the antibody waning. If you try to see what's happening to the cellular immune response, it takes a special laboratory. I was lucky, one of my students, Alan Landy, has a, in Chicago, has a way of measuring the, uh, the T cell responses and the antibodies. And we measured everything. And last week he called me and said that you're cellular immune response. I got vaccinated in January. And he said that your cellular immune response to the vaccine was really very good. 
particularly right at the early beginning, and it got better with the with the uh, boosters. So you have antibodies and you have cellular immune response. The two of them together give you that protection. Should last at least a year, probably two years, maybe five years. So that those that information is not known. You know, it's remarkable what we've been able to get as information in just 18 months. So we then realize that if we are programmed to get a vaccine, we'd like to be sure it works against the variants. It does. The most important message, which most of your epidemiologists and doctors will say, get the vaccine. I think most of you online will be have been vaccinated. I have actually discussed people with people uh, why they're not getting a vaccine. What we are concerned about is if this variant, for example, is not blocked, it may start replicating easily and convert into something that the vaccines won't work against. So we've got to get more and more people vaccinated. I think now we've got 75% of the United States vaccinated. Doesn't matter in the Southern states where a lot of vaccines were not given or accepted, uh, there are a lot of infections. And it's a concern of ours that a new variant, not the Delta, uh, the Epsilon or new one will come along that will be resistant to the antibodies and the cellular immune response induced by a vaccine. Uh, so the last thing I'll say is the schools. And uh, I, I think it's a real challenge to parents as well as the school superintendents and the school boards and of course the teachers. I think it's a very simple message. We've got to get the children back in. We're waiting the 12 years and older can be vaccinated. They'll be protected from zero. It won't be zero because the babies really don't, probably don't even have receptors for the coronavirus yet in their nasal and mouth uh, oral cavities. So from probably three or four to 12, that's the area, that's the children's uh, group that we now need to be sure we can handle. But you can't just give the vaccine. You have to do the test because children are smaller and you don't wanna to give too strong of a vaccine, you might induce such a strong reaction, it could be really toxic to the child. So in a school, uh, and you can check, as you know, in the schools where maybe your children are going to, they should be only allowing people in the school, in most, in, obviously the teachers uh, that have been vaccinated, and a parent could come if they've been vaccinated. I don't think they're all the parents, but maybe one parent. And uh, the children should be spaced, not the six, you don't think you have to go six feet, you'll probably be about three feet. And they, all the children will wear masks. So with that as a prevention, and as they, you know, these are mediators, me, mitigators, then you will, hopefully keep the level of infection very low. And I would say in San Francisco, we're fortunate because the community has been very good and the level of infection is quite low. So we probably have a very easy job keeping this out of the schools, but we must follow the directions that have been developed so that we get that uh, preventive action. So I think Donna, I'll stop here and allow uh, and start with some of the questions. Uh, and if I haven't covered some of the major features that you'd like to please ask, that's it. So uh, it's Dr. Malik Morvan, who is my associate, who's gonna handle the questions. So Malik, uh, go ahead, thank you. Okay, uh, yes, so uh, we didn't get a lot of questions in this chat right now, so I would recommend uh, people type their questions if they have some. So we're going to talk about the question we received before and before the meeting. Um, so the, one of the questions was about, was about vaccine hesitancy, uh, especially in the young uh, population. People don't necessarily understand how the vaccine works. And uh, maybe it would be a good thing to remind people that uh, the vaccine that, that we are using right now, they are not uh, giving you the virus. Uh, so could you comment on that and maybe explain how the vaccines work? 
Well, I, yes, so we did that the last time and I'll review it, absolutely. In fact, uh, thanks for reminding me because I should be showing this chart. Uh, the <laughs> genetic code is from the chromosome. The DNA is, has the uh, message. The DNA makes a copy of itself into RNA, which circulates in the cells. And the RNA makes the protein that is the structure of the cells and any of the components of a cell and any of the, any of the secretions of the cell. Now we have, right now we have three different proteins. The first ones that were successful were the RNA. In other words, they didn't take the chromosome nucleic acid message, they took the RNA and that's the Moderna and the Pfizer. And then the next one, which is Johnson Johnson took DNA, which they took a, a virus the, uh, <clears throat> and made the virus as a vector and that virus uh, then had in it the components of the, of the coronavirus. So it's a DNA virus, has in it the message for proteins of the coronavirus, COVID-19, and that gives rise to the protein. And then the protein induces the immune response. So the RNA makes the protein directly, and the DNA makes the RNA that makes the protein, which you then uh, get a protein for uh, immunizing and having prevention of infection. Now, there is one more vaccine we may discuss today, and that's the Novavax protein, uh, vaccine, which is made from the protein, from the spike protein, that pink circle I, sh uh, I showed you. They have taken that and they make a vaccine out of that protein. By the way, that is the most conventional, the polio vaccine, the measles and mumps and so forth. They're all made by as a protein. And I will say that that has convinced some people uh, to wait and take the Novavax pro vaccine. I mean, they all work well and it's disappointing, but they some people say we want a conventional because as uh, Malik may see in some of the questions, uh, some people believe that the RNA is, uh, is taken into your arm and it shouldn't be there and it sets up a deposit that influences all the genes that are in your body. That's not true at all. It only lasts for a, maybe a day or two, and it makes the RNA, makes the protein, the, the spike protein, which then creates the, uh, the vaccine against the virus. So remembering that, that you have three different ways of making the vaccine, the RNA is new and it was not, it's not, was it made overnight? Some people, some reporters are saying, remarkable, we got this RNA vaccine within a few, if you, really a few months. When actually the work on this vaccine began in 2003, when the first coronavirus SARS created a, a, a terrible disease, the respiratory disease, but, uh, and, and that led now to this current one where we have the advantage of using the RNA that has been done by Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, therefore, if people are concerned because they've been fed information that's incorrect, but they still will say, I'll take a vaccine, the Novavax vaccine will be available within a few, I, I hope within a few weeks. And that then will satisfy those that say, I want to wait till, till the conventional vaccine is used. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that focused enough, Mele? Yeah, I think so. Uh, th there's also some questions about uh, the, in the other ingredients in the vaccine, other ingredients than the mRNA. Can you, can you comment on what uh, those are? Ab absolutely. I've, I've faced that before. Yeah. <clears throat> The reason the RNA vaccine was not made in the past is because no one could figure out how you could protect that RNA when it's injected into your arm. There are enzymes there, RNAases they're called, that destroy it immediately. So it took 10 years to develop a mechanism by which you could protect the RNA. And that is with a compounds that protect it and it's in a lipid, droplet, just a oil droplet. 
And that then permits you to inject the oil droplet, which is not, uh, have any compound that would give any allergies. Uh, and it goes into the arm, it stays there. The RNA is able to come out, produce the protein, produce the protein and the, the fatty globule disappears, okay? So th that is, those are the two ingredients. They have a stabilizer, which has been used in lots of vaccines, and then this lipid droplet, which protects the RNA. You think it's easy, but when you read the history of how many times they tried to get an RNA injected, let's say first into, into an animal uh, that would remain long enough to produce the protein, it was extremely difficult. Manning, okay. And Dr. Levy, if, okay. you can, yeah. if, if we have a hard time hearing Dr. Marvin, can you repeat the question? Okay. Well, that was a question about what other ingredients in the vaccine uh, might, might affect someone if they're getting immunized. They, they, because incorrectly, it's been said that the RNA can actually get into cells. It, it comes from within the cell, but it could go backwards, never been described, and start manipulating uh, genes and create uh, some dangerous uh, side effects. So my point was, it doesn't do that, but if anyone is concerned about that, the Novavax vaccine doesn't use DNA, it doesn't use RNA, it uses the protein itself, like polio, measles, chickenpox, and so forth. And that then allows just the spike protein to be made, and you then create an immune response to that protein. Okay, great. So we had another question, especially regarding the benefits of vaccination compared to natural infection, especially uh, in uh, populations that are less at risk, like children. Uh, wouldn't it be better to just let them get infected instead of vaccinating them? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in principle, uh, they're asking the right question because coronaviruses are really a family of viruses that cause the common cold. So what if this got into a child and would it be any danger? Well, that was originally what people were thinking. But when it gets into a child, there are now, because of the variant, children that are hospitalized. Some of them I, I have died because the variant is able to create such a toxic environment within the child, very rare, very rare, less than one in 100,000, something like that. But then that the person asked the question is correct because the studies in Israel have shown that if you had a natural infection with COVID, you maintain that longer than people who are immunized. Now, how much longer? They don't know. You know this, is, this is very important for everyone to recognize that we've only been in this a year and a half. You look at other vaccines against viruses, I mean, they've taken years to actually evaluate. So the reason the FDA has taken so long, took so long to approve of the RNA vaccines, they had to be sure that over time, some of the things that people are questioning, like one of the questions that I got with, with, with parents was, will that affect the fertility of my child? How would, an RNA affect the fertility of the child. And then we tried to answer that. Well, they can, they can do the studies and figure that and, and regulate, but there is no evidence of that. So the fact is that unfortunately, if we let natural infection occurs, particularly in children, there is a real risk that they also could have toxic effects and not survive. And that definitely is true for adults. So while that sounds like something that will be forced on people in lesser developed countries, in our, in our country, in the Western countries, we need to avoid these unnecessary deaths, which are occurring when people aren't vaccinated and they get the natural infection. Great, thank you. So the next question is about, uh, do we know by which mechanism the Delta variant uh, is uh, either more dangerous, also more, is able to spread more rapidly uh, among people. Do you have any explanation so far? 
Yeah, the explanation I did I mentioned in the in the beginning when the when that spike protein attaches to the cell goes to a cell. In principle, in in virology, which is an area, of course, as you know, I've been I studied now for many years. You know, one one spike protein attached to one receptor usually doesn't do anything. It's not that strong, and it gets the virus gets kicked away. Usually, for and most viruses, it may be two or three receptors that come together, and then the virus goes in. The variant I haven't read any of the basic work on it. Apparently, the variant doesn't need a lot of receptors, it just attaches to the receptor and strongly binds. And then what happens, the receptor goes back in the cell, carrying the virus with it, and you've got an infection of the cell. And then as we've talked about in the past, that virus grabs the machinery of the cell and starts replicating like crazy. That's what its job is to do, that's its destiny. And in doing that, I want, want to emphasize they make a lot of dead viruses. I like to feel that the ones that replicate the most, like the variant, will cause a lot of mistakes. Unfortunately, those that mutation rate may produce a variant that by chance is able to escape the vaccines we're using. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question about long COVID. So those people who uh, get symptoms for long after they clear the infection, can you comment on that? Uh, what could be uh, what could be the mechanism behind that in terms of vaccinated patients? Should they fear that, and is it more at risk with the Delta variant? Okay, uh, quickly saying, apparently the variant will also give rise to the long co uh, long haulers or long COVID. Uh, let me say that uh, some of you will know that my lab worked on chronic fatigue syndrome in the aughts, uh, in 2003, 4, 5, uh, and we really were looking at trying to find out why so many people, mostly in Lake Tahoe, were getting this terribly chron chronic fatigue, but we were able to show in these people and, and published on it that they are tired because the toxic substances that an activated immune system makes causes fatigue. So if we could get rid of and prevent that from being done, you will not, you'll get rid of the fatigue. Well, you need the toxic substances to get rid of the virus. So these viral related chronic fatigue syndromes, which is really what this is, a chronic fatigue syndrome following a very strong reaction of the immune system uh, to COVID is an inability for the immune system to quiet down. We did this uh, in several, uh, several ways, and we actually found there is a cell called the natural killer cell that must come forward and secrete some substances that says to the immune system, okay, the virus is gone, calm down. Some people, it doesn't calm down for months or years. And that's what you're seeing, maybe a little in a different way, but as far as I can interpret this, it's seeing again, chronic fatigue syndrome, or I used to call it chronic immune activation syndrome. So we, we hope maybe with the funding that's going in to try to help all these people that have this side effect of the infection, we'll discover ways in which can treat. Very difficult to treat an immune disorder. What are you going to do? You can't, you treat one side of the immune system, the other side of the immune system. You can't treat the whole immune system because then you don't have a defense against bacteria and viruses. So it's really difficult. Our message in the days of chronic fatigue syndrome was get the rest you need, try to recognize that in most cases it will go away. And then we hope there will be drugs available that will relieve the fatigue and relieve the pain and the, the side effects of what you call COVID or long hauler disease or what we used to call chronic fatigue syndrome. Thank you. So another question that has come up in the chat and also uh, in the questions we received since yesterday is if I get two shots of the Moderna vaccine, should the booster be Moderna as well? Do you have any uh, insight on those? Should we be selective? Uh, booster shot? Yeah, as far as I can tell, 
uh, they're so similar. And we don't, there have been reports of some people arriving, they couldn't get the Moderna, so they took the Pfizer or they just the opposite. And they, they're interchangeable. There are some, there's some measurements that say that the Pfizer vaccine may not give as long, the, the Pfizer vaccine may not give as long a protection as Moderna, but then Moderna may give more symptoms. There, there's always a trade-off, but, but the quick point is they're very similar. So if you get one as a boost, uh, uh, get one and then want a booster and you don't have the Moderna or the Pfizer, you can get, they're interchangeably. So, um, and, and, and then we get into whether you need the third booster, but I'll wait for someone to ask me that question. Okay. Um, go ahead, Manny. Yeah, well, that's, that's another question because that, that, that's the next one. Do I really need to get the, the third booster shot? Uh, am I protected enough if I only get two shots? And what am I safe with two shots only? Well, I would hope that the group listening uh, in my discussion of how you have two arms of the immune system, the antibodies and the cellular immune system that assures you of protection. Protection even of infection, which they can't measure, or of getting a lot of uh, colds, uh, fever, fatigue, so forth. It is, th these vaccines work remarkably well. So when the antibodies start to go down, there is, I think, a bit of a panic of researchers or public health people thinking that your immune system is not going to hold up against a, a reinfection by the virus. I have not seen definitive data. You are, you do see data from Israel saying that as they wait longer, the reinfections are occurring for the, with the people who got the vaccine early. So the question is, do you want to get that booster to prevent getting a, uh, preventing, to bring the antibodies back up. Because if you read the articles, they'll say a tremendous increase in antibodies is seen. Absolutely. It's one of the reasons you do better getting your booster shot, not, every, uh, not one month, two months, three months, but maybe six, eight, 10 months after, because you're getting an immune system that's learning how to respond against that virus. And now it's ready to boost itself up. Do you need three shots? Well, I'm afraid our, some of the leaders of our public health programs are saying you need it. I think that's a, dis that's a discussion point that would take longer here, but we need, the easiest answer is we really need more clinical studies. I mean, it can't be anecdotes. It can't be telling people saying, well, I, I heard of somebody who had got two vaccinations and they had the Delta, they, they tested positive for the Delta virus. Some of them got really sick. Well, you have to ask under what conditions were they, was it done? Would that person have responded well to the vaccine anyway? Uh, and do we have enough of the vaccine to give it to everyone in the United States? Are you morally obligated or ethically thinking to say there are people dying because they can't get a shot and we're taking three shots? Now that, that's the moral argument. There's also the argument that I raise, I raise and others have seen in immunology, it's been shown uh, the concept of original sin. What that says is when you get a vaccine, you have to respond to it. You get a booster, it's a better respond to it. If you get a third shot, it's not necessary that you will make a further immune response that will take care of the variant or something else. Original sin says, the immune system says, I've seen this booster. I've seen this vaccine. I'm going to respond just the way I did the last time. So it's not assured that that booster will give you a, 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 a response to lots of different variants. What does that mean? That means after getting the third booster, you'll need a fourth booster. And do we really think this is the way we should go? We have to understand it much better. So. If you're immunocompromised, if you're over the age of 65, uh, it is recommended, but permit mostly, and that I think it's gonna come out September 20th when uh, the government's gonna cover the cost of a third booster shot. Uh, they will say you have to have a, an immune compromised situation 
and B, and that will be number one, and then the age will be separate to that, and that will be you're able to do it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say, and, and maybe an answer to this, I had a I had a I see HIV patients, and I saw an HIV patient, and he said, oh, you know, I went to the pharmacy and I asked for the booster shot, and they gave it to me. I filled out some forms, I got it. I think that's happening all over. So if you want to get the booster, you don't even need the you don't even need in this city the doctor's prescription. I may be wrong, and so you I'm sure I'll get letters <laughs> changing in my mind, but essentially it's before the CDC, before the FDA has approved of it. The CDC has already said, yeah, it looks pretty good. And frankly, the president has said, oh, we should be doing this. And, and others are saying, we better use the booster, third booster. Why? If you look at the data, it's because a certain number of people are getting infected by the variant and they don't want that to happen. And I'm going to argue that you need to weigh the differences. And if you're in an immunocompromised situation, absolutely. Now I ask one other point that I think you should think of. What if you have an immunologic disease, but you don't really, it's not showing itself, you have some arthritis or something. Um, there are some, you're going to hear some of these reports of people having a worse reaction because the immune system is revved up and it revs up the immune reaction to the, in their own disease. So it may not be so harmless. That's why we need the studies to say, if you get a third booster, is it really harmless? Do, is there any serious side effects so that we don't get a lot of people getting the booster without knowing the consequences, if there are any? Okay, just a, a quick follow-up question. Uh, we talked about uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccine being, being kind of compatible because they use the same technology. What about mixing and matching uh, with the, the Johnson & Johnson and another mRNA antibody? Is that safe? I don't think there'll be any, I, I don't think there'll be any harm. Uh, I do know some, some people who have been, had a natural infection and they're concerned about how they're going to go into restaurants because they need to show that they've been vaccinated because we haven't got sophisticated enough to know that natural infections give you a pretty darn good immune reaction. It, it, I always bring up shingles, which I hope all of you, if you're over the age of 50, are getting your shingle shot. But I, when, I, when someone had shingles, they called me on the phone and said, uh, Dr. Levy, should I be getting my shingles vaccine? I said, so I called Ann Arkin at Sanford who developed the vaccine. She said, Jay, they got the better vaccine. They got the natural infection. So I've been waiting to see that a natural COVID might be slightly better. It looks like it's a trade-off. There are certain things that you do give it a natural infection and others in which you say, well, you probably, you probably should get your, your uh, vaccination. Um, in this situation, the Johnson & Johnson's one shot. It's a DNA vaccine, so it's different. And you may be doing something good. I don't have the answer. No one has the answer. They're going to have to do a study. And I'll just mention something that's very important to know. The reason that the RNA vaccines got approved so quickly is that they were developed during a pandemic. So they had enough people taking the RNA vaccine and enough that took other things to prevent the disease, try to approach the disease very quickly. Three or four, three months, I had the answer. Now we're doing such a good job that to find a cohort that is getting lots of infections is not, is not, is not easy, thank goodness, but then you're going to have to wait a while. So I don't know how they're going to answer it. I, I have always used what I learned in medical school. Don't use a medicine if it's not needed. So I just leave you with that advice for this question. Okay, so... Aside from the vaccine, we're getting a lot of questions about that. Um, is it better to wear an N95 mask or surgical mask or clothes mask or uh, a combination of both? Can you uh, give us some comments? All right, thank you. I've uh, been waiting for that. It's a big discussion here at the university. Some people are saying double mask, uh, use a different mask, so forth. I try to explain that. This is a surgical mask, and it's good. 
in fact, if I were an aerosol, this is a, you know, which is a, uh, a, a water droplet, and it alights on the mask, it's going to attach here. And I don't see how the virus is going to find its way through, find its way into the nose or the oral cavity. As long as you block these aerosols, you should be protected. The only thing that worries me is if you take the mask off and you have to shake it, the virus may be in the air. So wash them at the end of the day uh, if, or throw them away. Some people throw them away. Now, the other mask I use, because it's a little more comfortable, is this mask. And there again, the, we're saying that the aerosol is going to find its way in here and go to the nose and infect the person. I don't see it. I'm sorry, I don't see it. I think anything that covers your nose and your mouth is going to prevent you from infecting someone at a certain percentage and prevent you from being infected. So really the message is make it simple. If your child wants to, if your child has got to wear a mask, make a simple mask and have it covered. If anyone in your family, take a simple mask and make it, make it used. N95s are terrific, but they may be the, the Rolls Royce of a mask, whereas you could use, um, I don't know, a Tesla. <laughs> that's what we have in the family. Okay. Anyway, uh, maybe that, that's my impression. I'm sure I'll get a lot of heat on this, but really it just, this is common sense. It, and I'll just say one thing. One of the reasons that the CDC recommended double masking was they took Andy, the, the model the, 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 we used to practice uh, uh, respiration uh, control and, and recovery. Annie, Annie called 911. Some of you re remember that for your first aid chart. And they sprayed fluorescent droplets on it. And they found that when they took the mask off, uh, there were some droplets on the face. Okay. And, and they thought, well, that's dangerous because it may get into the nose and so forth. But then they went and they tied a knot on the mask and then put it back on the mannequin and no fluorescent droplets. In other words, the message is wear a face covering. That's the word I like. A face covering that fits correctly. A lot of the data that's collected that the N95 is better than this one or that one, I think, and you can call me wrong, is that they're not worn right. And when I see people walking around with this kind of mask like this, I'm thinking, what, what are they doing? Okay, man. I, and Dr. Yeah. Levy, I'm Thank you. So, because one person wants to yeah. know, uh, with people reusing masks, how long should they be left out before you can reuse them? Oh, can they wash them? Uh, so some are surgical masks. They say some people reuse surgical masks. Re re reuse these? Uh, well, the virus is very sensitive to the outside. So they want to do it, leave it outside. Uh, and that's leave it outside for an hour, hour or two, maybe two hours. I think, yeah, but you can, I don't okay. think it's too expensive. <laughs> oh, and let me, let me, uh, before we, yeah, go ahead, Maylie. I have one thing more. Yeah, someone was asking which 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 one uh, were you wearing? What's the brand of your mask you're wearing? Some people seem to like. Oh, this is this one or this one? This is a surgical mask. It's got the demi. It's so got the the fancy, the fancy blue one. What? The closed one. The closed oh, this one. one. Uh, I don't know. My wife gave it to me, so I can't really answer. I, I, I think uh, you know. You know, <laughs> this is really going to get me in trouble. You know, the the shoes Rothies that are made from plastic bottles and stuff. Well, they they make these shoes, and my wife likes them. And then the shop decided they'll use the same procedure, and they make these, which is very tightly knit, uh, and they come in different colors, but uh, they're comfortable. But most people say. Trade this in and get the surgical mask. A lot of people say not. I won't say most people. A lot of people say. 
So uh, I, this is okay. a terrific question. Yeah, one, one last Ahead. One last question about the ocular transmission. Uh, so a lot of people are saying, should you put, uh, wear face shield, goggles, and things like that? Is the virus infecting people through the eyes? Uh, good point. I've always wondered why they haven't gotten to that point. Uh, when I dealt with HIV, uh, everyone's thinking that you couldn't cry when you're with a, uh, you couldn't be with a person who's infected because they'd be crying. And they this, they forgot this HIV is the same kind of virus. It's a lipid sugar type covering. Uh, the tears are terrific, they just, just destroy it. Whereas saliva had some antiviral effect, but not, not the same thing. So I think the tears are gonna be protective if we were doing basic research, and maybe this encouraged some people doing basic research, why don't you take some of the coronavirus, mix it in with tears, and then everyone will get the answer. I think you'll see that what protects you from other viruses protects you from the coronavirus. Now, my last point, uh, Mele, is I wanna talk about testing uh, because it's really bothered me. Uh, we, we have a city that's been great control. I think to some extent it's, uh, been a very uh, tough on the population. Uh, but what, what really needs to be done, and it was from the very beginning, is have good testing. And that's not unusual for San Francisco. It's true for everywhere. We don't have the testing. I mean, we, we have friends in Denmark, I think that's it, where you can go to the corner and there's tests in and it's free. I was so tired, I decided, I don't think I'm infected, I better get I better get a test done. I had the same problem my friends did. We called around urgent care for it's impossible hospital. No, all these places, there was no spot. I'm sure many of you had the same thing to get your name on. Well, if you're waiting two, three days and you happen to be infected, they expect you to quarantine. Well, it's not fair. So what we were able to do, and of course it's because I have the funds, I bought a home kit from Abbott, $30. And I was told that everybody has $30 to pay for it. That home kit was able to give me the result in 15 minutes. And in fact, I talked to a colleague of mine who works in viruses and she's writing a book on testing. And when, and, and when I told her about the, um, the Avid home kit, which is so wonderful because we had a dinner that night and I didn't think I could go and immediately got answers. She said, in fact, if you, have the, when you buy this kit, I'm not, I don't work for Abbott, and maybe there's another another company that makes it, but frankly, it, it's worth it. Peace of mind, it works very well. If you do it, it's very sensitive, but not as sensitive as the PCR, the where they measure the sequence. But that takes 24 hours, maybe 48 hours. This back, this friend of mine back, he said, Jay, if you take the test one day and then take it the next day because you get two tests in one kit for $30. That's as good as a PCR. So I, I actually told Aaron all day from the, from the Chronicle, something should be written up on this, except it should be given free. If we wanna block the spread in the city, we should allow people to just go into an urgent care or, or, or CVS and just get it. Uh, but you can't, you have to get an appointment, any case, and, it, and you pay for it. But you don't pay for the booster. So I have a hard time with this. Maybe, is that it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of the questions. Maybe one last one okay. uh, about kids and school. Uh, is it safer to have all the kids eating at the same time or short amount of time, or to have the kids coming one after the other with the risk that the virus accumulates in the cafeteria. Well, did, what they, are your did they say if the children had masks on? No, it's for lunch, so they don't have masks on. They have no mask in the school? Yeah, or they're at, home. they're at home, uh, at lunch, lunch someplace, okay. For, for, for lunch, for lunch. All right. And would and were these were, and they weren't vaccinated? I, I'm guessing it's, it's for younger children. 
So under 12 years. Under 12 years. Okay. Lunch. So, so yes. you know, I think the chances in this city, that's the main reason you're not in a in a community that's uh, the virus is spreading like crazy. I'd say it's extremely rare. I think they have a extreme, very rare chance of getting infected. However, I would do physical state spacing, three feet, four feet distancing when the children come in. And if they all want to come in together, they can be in a room, but we'd want that. Even better, and I didn't say this for the schools, it's nice if you have the windows up with some circulation, and even better is if you have the school outside. It would be very, uh, it would be nice for the children. And we can do it in the city. Well, not all the time in this city, but in many cities you can. Okay, Malik, anything else? Malik. No, I think we're, I think we're good. I think we're good. Okay. Well, I want to, yeah, and Dr. Levy, is there anything that was not asked that you would like to uh, tell the group before we depart? No, but I, I, I just want to emphasize common sense. and I don't want them to get crazy with some of the, I say it sometimes to people, and, and I'm not trying to say I answer that question, but there are too many experts. Everybody gives their idea, and you could say, well, that's what Levy's doing. So you have to be sure when you listen, if you're going to change your mind, resulting from somebody who was on the radio or on TV, please make sure you look back at their background, find out, how, do they have experience? Really good if they're working in a lab or they measured viruses or things like that, if you're going to accept that information. Um, and this, this setting that uh, Donna has, where we have discussions here with the community, are very helpful because I think you can appreciate how you hear information and just think of it with common sense and you'll, in most cases, be doing the right thing. Well, and on behalf of the Stanford Club of San Francisco and Next Village San Francisco, I wanna thank you again, Dr. Levy, and thank you, Dr. Morvan, for uh, moderating our Q&A on the road. I uh, really appreciate it because this has been such a wonderful opportunity for all of us to get questions answered, common sense when we're hearing different uh, things left and right. So we really, really appreciate. And I hope everyone can join me in a muted round of applause for Dr. Levy. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much.